So we're going to start with Jim Haber, and let me tell you a little about Jim. He is a Jewish fairy Catholic worker, as, as he has asked me to introduce him. Stand up, Jim. <laughs> He is here on behalf of the, um, the BDS movement, the Boycott, Divest, and Sanction movement, because he's been working on this issue for a long time, um, especially with Jewish Voice for Peace. And uh, I've known Jim since I walked through the desert with him in the Nevada desert experience um, on the way to the Nevada test site a number of years ago. And I'll never forget that. <laughs> never forget that. Um, Take it away, Jim. So uh, I just want to say I, I've been, I guess I got, I mean, I grew up Jewish, cared about Palestine some, but grew up with a lot of the usual rifts, like uh, it was a land for people, for people without a land. So I grew up Zionist, uh, not rabidly so, but definitely in a reformed Jewish family up in the Bay Area, believed that Israel was part of my heritage, and I still do, but I don't feel like a 2,000-year-old claim should have any merit today. And certainly the oppression being done uh, in the name of Judaism, in the name of Zionism, uh, is, I think, antithetical to our faith. And so I became active around the time of the Second Intifada in the early 2000s. My oldest sister lives in Israel on a kibbutz. She lived in Jerusalem, and I'd say she's a liberal Zionist, not bad-hearted, but buying into some uh, tropes that uh, many people buy into that we're all working against. So um, I've been active with Jewish Voice for Peace since around 2000. Uh, part of me, when I was asked to speak, I said, well, maybe you could find a Palestinian to speak about their struggle. But I am a war tax resistor for a long time, and I think it's also important that Jewish voices are heard uh, on this issue because it's important for people in the presumed oppressor class to be visible against the oppression that is associated with us. So... Uh, I'm glad to be part of this community, and as such, I'm happy to speak about boycott movements um, regarding Israel and Palestine. So um, something that's come up for me over the years around this is that people don't pay attention to the actual details. People hear boycott Israel, and they think it means things they don't. So I think it's important for people to refer to the actual Palestinian civil society pages that deal with this. So like bdsmovement.net would be a place to go for direct information so you can find out what they're actually calling for. Because so often the phrase, you know, it's a slogan, uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. So I think that's a fine thing to chant. And it causes other Jews to get apoplectic, though, feeling like, even if we're about to push Palestinians, or I mean, if Israel is about to put, push Palestinians into the ocean, but the fear is that we're going to get thrown into the ocean. But the existential threat is not Jews or Israelis, it is Palestinians. And so I find Jewish Voice for Peace to be a strong base from which to work from. That said, in 2016, 2017, a group called the Center for Jewish Nonviolence which doesn't have an office and has just organized four delegations. Uh, I went 2016 and 2017 with the Center for Jewish Nonviolence uh, to the South Hebron Hills and did organizing projects, helped create a peace camp uh, that still exists actually south of Hebron. And so uh, I've been back recently and feel happy to talk about boycott and the need for it and point out some things that we need to deal with here. So that was background. Uh, I helped run a Catholic worker soup kitchen for many years in San Francisco, which is how I met some people here. I lived in Nevada for six years doing anti-nuclear and anti-drone organizing, how I know other people here. So back to the, the question at hand. Um, you know, the boycott in, in 2005, 
Palestinian civil society came up with this boycott call. Uh, even earlier than that, there were boycott movements against companies like Caterpillar and uh, Motorola that was doing some support um, for the Israeli military and the occupation. So some of that predates this civil society call, but the civil society call is really deep and profound, and there's a lot of information, again, at bdsmovement.net. In addition to that, there's an academic and cultural boycott that even predates that, which gets a lot of pushback. A lot of people, in my experience, are really concerned about the idea of boycotting academics, and what about, or, or what about that poor Israeli violinist, and what do you have against them? <laughs> And again, this all just shows me that people have not paid attention to what the Palestinian Civil Society actually is calling for. So you got to check out USACBI.org. That's uh, actually the US. It's, it's the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. So it's USACBI.org. And if you look at what they say, it's not like boycotting all Israelis or all Israeli artists. It's when they are, or when they are performing as an instrument of the state, when they're part of what's called brand Israel. And you can look this up. This is a real thing. Brand Israel is an Israeli state program designed to counter all the bad publicity because of the shit that they're doing. And it's a cover-up. And so um, if an artist is performing in any association or if the funding is part of brand Israel, then that is boycottable. But just because someone's an Israeli... According now, you may decide I don't want to have anything to do with Israelis. I'm so mad at them. But that's not what the Palestine Civil Society call is, and it gets characterized as that. And we need to push back and tell people to look at what the Palestinians are actually saying. Now they could say, "Well, we don't believe anything Palestinians say. They're all liars." But that's on them, you know. I mean, that's what I got growing up in the '70s. It's like any Palestinian that says they want peace, you can't believe them. I know that's just not true. That's what we were raised with, and it's not true. But this is the stuff we still get. So we just have to stay firm with, well, no, that's not a basis for legal action or anything. You got to take people at their word somewhat. And my experience with Palestinians is they're at least as, severe, as sincere as, you know, Israelis. You know, we know that race and class doesn't mean you're good or bad, and we fall into this trap, or other people do, and somehow we need to get them out of this um, dichotomy, false dichotomy. Um, so a couple, it's also really important. So there's what's going on in, in Palestine. So like in the 90s, Israel made like the occupied territories use the Israeli currency. So if Palestinians wanted to not buy Israel, it became substantially harder for them to. And ever since then, Israel makes Palestinians buy Israeli goods. And it makes it hard for Palestinian farmers to sell their goods. So this is a form that's less present here, but is very real on the ground there. Um, so it's hard for Palestinians even to boycott Israel. Um, some people here want to boycott settler goods. If they're in the illegal settlements, then we want to not participate. But if they're from Israel itself, then we want to make that distinction to show we're not anti-Israel, but we're anti-occupation. Um, all the reports, I, I can't remember, I was just looking at a report that talks about how that distinction, you can't really make that distinction um, because... Uh, the European Union uh, it, was trying to figure out how to make that distinction. Uh, the European common market, they can't. So you, you have to, you have to, you can't separate it out because Israel's not interested in separating it out. Um, they're interested in the conflating of Judaism and Zionism because that confusion makes people hesitant to be critical of Israel because they don't want to be called anti-Semitic which actually gets us to what's going on in this country because charges of anti-Semitism abound. And now there's very scary legal maneuvers enacted in like 20 states that make it illegal to boycott Israel. Or what they do is like in Texas, 
like if you want to get a contract with the state, or actually in California, it's the law also. This was passed by law in New York. Andrew Cuomo did it as an executive action. But here it was actually legislatively passed last year that now they haven't implemented it in California as far as I know, but in some states they have, where if you want to get a, a contract with the state or with a government entity, you have to certify that you're not boycotting Israel for political reasons. Now, this was applied in, it's being challenged, the ACLU, in, in California, I don't know of any cases, but a big one in, um, in Kansas, where a teacher uh, got a contract to do a teacher training program, and to get the contract, she had to sign that she wasn't boycotting it. This is now a case that's being adjudicated. Um, in, in Texas, in a, in a suburb of Houston uh, to get assistance for rebuilding after the hurricane. There was a checkbox on the form to get government assistance saying that you were not boycotting Israel. For private individuals, they took the question off. I believe it still is there for businesses seeking assistance, hurricane relief assistance. Um, I'm jumping around a little bit in my notes. Uh, so I mentioned brand Israel earlier. There's something, I don't know, how many people here ever seen or heard of the movie Occupation of the American Mind? <laughs> yeah, that's right, I think so. So anyways, I, I recommend it. It's, it's pretty, it, it talks about the official Israeli military program, which is called Hasbara. You can look that up, H-A-S-B-A-R-A. -A. This is an official Israeli military program that is all about countering the negative publicity that their actions engender. And so that movie covers a lot of this area. And Brand Israel, you know, it's like there is pink washing where, oh, women are treated better in Israel than in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. Queers and trans folk are treated better in Israel than in, the, and you know, this is pink washing, as we call it. Green washing also exists, where they try to get people to see Israel as this environmental bastion in, you know, the destructive uh, Middle East. And it's all part of a cover-up to make the abuses of Palestinians seem less important or defensible. Um, I should probably hurry up. Let's see. Uh, yeah, like 20 states now, I think, have it. On the federal level, there is a bill uh, in the Senate and the House, S-720, introduced by Ben Cardin, a Democrat. You know, Democrats are sickeningly pro-Israel also. A lot of guilt from the Holocaust, I guess. And I'm disgusted with Kamala Harris, our junior senator from this state, because she is horrific on Palestine. Whatever else she wants to be seen as progressive on, she is not. Uh, and, and in the Senate, S-720 has 41 Republican and 14 Democratic co-sponsors. That's a huge number, but it was introduced last year and it hasn't moved. And there is a companion House bill, H.R. 1697. And these would make huge felony penalties for boycotting Israel, like $250,000 minimum fine and up to 10 years in prison. And, it's, and there's not much pushback, but it is, well, we'll see what pushback there is. Um, so BDS often gets thrown out. Um, raise your hand, please be, don't be embarrassed if you don't know what BDS stands for. Please raise your hand if you don't know what the B, the D, and the S stand for. So look around, see you're not alone, okay? Now, I'm in audiences sometimes, and people are talking, and they have BDS, BDS. And, you know, some college student sits next to me finally asks what it is. And I'm like, we know not to use acronym salads, right? And people do it, especially with BDS. Boycotts, divestment, and sanctions. And they are not the same thing. I want to encourage people to parse that out, to look at each one. Sanctions, we don't have... That's a governmental thing, like to sanction, you know, international bodies sanction. We're not personally going to be sanctioning Israel. But divestment and um, 
boycotts, we have more ability to do. Divestment, I mean, there were divestment campaigns against Caterpillar that were successful to a certain extent, and their, their, their popularity went down, but they've recovered some. Um, we can boycott consumer goods. Now, Israel's sort of insulated uh, a lot, you know, it's boycotting companies that profit from the occupation in many cases, not just Israeli companies. So like, or companies, you know, SodaStream was made in the West Bank. Now they've moved out of the West Bank, but they're still really horrific in how they treat Palestinians. Um, Airbnb, there's a campaign against Airbnb because they lease out homes in illegal settlements as Israel, which they are not. So that's not correct. And so there's a campaign, uh, Code Pink actually has initiated the, the, uh, the campaign against Airbnb. Um, uh, Hewlett Packard, the longstanding campaign against Hewlett Packard because they do the biometric stuff like Polaroid did in South Africa IBM made the machines for Nazi Germany to catalog us. Well, Hewlett Packard is doing to Palestine uh, what those companies did uh, to the Jews of Germany and to the blacks of South Africa. So we don't want people buying Hewlett Packard. Um, the, I need to say about the academic and cultural boycott. So again, so an, an example, Brian Eno, his music was being used in a dance performance by an Israeli company, and that was fine. He didn't mind that. But when that company was going and doing a performance in London, in a performance that was sponsored in part by the Israeli consulate as part of its brand Israel thing, he said, no, you cannot use my music. And the, the choreographer has good politics and was upset. But Brian Eno said, no, you can't use my music because this particular performance falls under the guidelines of the boycott call. Um, now, it's really important. You know, when we hear that people have participated in something standing up against Israel for boycotts, we need to verbalize our support for them. So Natalie Portman just refused to go there. She needs support. Um, Ziggy Marley is going there, and we need to know that Ziggy Marley is, is not on board. Roger Waters is on board. Jalo Biafra, the last I understood, was not on board. And that breaks my heart as an old-time Dead Kennedys fan. <laughs> but, you know, it's uh, really hard. On campuses, we're being attacked for being in support of Palestinians. Palestinians speaking up for themselves, trying to tell their own narrative, are being called anti-Semitic and attacked by, take down these company names, um, Canary Mission, the Lawfare Project, and the David Horowitz Foundation. They are going after academics, students, and groups with bloody, vile poster campaigns on campuses that are very threatening to people because they're standing up for themselves, and we need to be conscious. Um, and I'm just about done. Um, I mentioned Airbnb, PayPal, very problematic. You can't process payments. Palestinians can't process PayPal. So try to use Venmo or something else if you can. Sometimes it's hard to avoid. Um, and Google Maps is still a... a Google Maps actually came on board. Google Maps finally did start naming Palestinian villages. So thank you to Google Maps. And anyways, I was just was jumping around a lot of information all over the place. And I didn't even talk about the Holy Land Foundation Five because they're because they're making it illegal to talk about Palestine. So thank you, everyone. I'll step back.
people there with a lot of experience to answer um, questions that we can answer <laughs> about that experience so that we can um, see where you might fit in or how you might fit in. So now we are um, going to present one of National War Tattoo Coordinating Council um, members and Administrative Council member Ann Barron. She's from San Diego. She's an activist in our movement and she wants to tell you her personal story and other things about divestment. What we're trying to do tonight is intersect these movements because they are all connected. Divestment from um, Israel, divestment from the military, divestment um, <coughs> from pipelines, you name it, we, from the banks. We need to see how these things are connected and what we can do about them. So take it away, Anne. Thank you. Hi, Anne Barron, San Diego. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> do you want me to stand up? Okay, um, so I do want to say that the talk we just heard uh, was pretty, perhaps, shocking. It's supposed to be the land of free speech, but I want to say that it tells us how powerful these tools are of divestment, of boycotting, and of sanctions, because they're trying to shut it down. So that tells me we're on the right track here. And um, I also want to say that uh, I am a war tax resistor. I, I became, I was able to be a real war tax resistor, which means I do not send my taxes to the IRS when it's tax time. It means that I, myself, I file my taxes, but I don't send them a check. And I actually redirect my taxes to human needs in my community. And I know that this is a powerful tool. Why? Because the Supreme Court continues to make it illegal to do war tax resistance. So when this power structure is saying no, 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 that means we're on the right track. And that's how I, that's why I use this tool. Because one of the things we talk a lot about in this type of movement is what's, and I'm, I do mainly divestment. Um, what is the best way to divest? What's the best tactic? Uh, where do we put our energies and our resources? So many war tax resistors do it out of a conscientious objection to war. Also not recognized in the um, United States. You can be a conscientious objector as a soldier, but not as a taxpayer. Um, so how do we do it? How do we move forward? I do my redirection every year. I've been doing it since my divorce, so I was able to finally start doing it. Because, um, you know, you, it's, this is not just a personal decision. It has repercussions because um, it is illegal. And my partner at the time was not a citizen. So you don't want to put people at risk. Um, but I, would you like to hear, this is a letter I wrote for this year? Okay. Dear IRS, this year I owe $703 in federal income taxes. There is again no check attached to my 1040 this year for federal taxes. I instead have paid my taxes to local peace and justice groups in San Diego that provide human services rather than war and destruction. I sincerely regret that I cannot in all conscience pay the U.S. Treasury the taxes that will be used for illegal actions like the April 13th attack on Syria, a sovereign nation. The attack on Syria contravenes both U.S. and international law. I believe in taxes as a necessary part of a civil society. However, the U.S. does not use my taxes for civil development. I cannot send my taxes to an administration that continues to decimate human services and natural systems. I cannot send my taxes to an administration that builds expensive divisive walls while working, people's, while working people struggle to pay our taxes and keep a roof over our heads. I cannot send my taxes to a country that values corporations over people, a government that allocates over 50% of its budget to war and destruction. So I believe in taxes. I just pay them elsewhere. So the enclosed check and covers my self-employment taxes I owe for 2017. Um, so that's, I've been sending this basically the same letter, different names, different nations, different wars since 2012. Um, even under the Obama administration, we've been in endless war. Um, what I think I'm most shocked about in this whole, my evolution in thinking about divestment is that I never knew about the uh, war tax resistance of the Vietnam War. 
how could I not know this? Why was this hidden from me? It was never taught to me in schools. And so it was only, you know, growing up and, and beginning to educate myself and talking with folks that I began to learn about these resistance tools. So um, I find it interesting that this, I was a school teacher, that we have such a sanitized view of our history and that we are, we are trained, we are, we are deeply embedded in thinking about systems as if they can't change. Systems change all the time. This is a huge system. It's bigger than the military industrial system. This is bigger than the, okay. it's, it's a prison industrial, okay. okay. It's a prison industrial military 1% complex. It's complicated, it's huge, it's all connected. But that is part of the, its downfall, too. It's all connected. So if you change one part of the system, the rest of the system has to change. Now, the government understands this completely, which is why they're working very hard to make sure that we can't change the parts of the system that will change the rest of the system. So I was watching what the government's doing. If they're telling us not to do something, go for it. Um, I want to say that uh, sanctions, the question of sanctions that you had mentioned, uh, while we cannot as individuals assert sanctions on other groups or peoples or, or nations, we can push our government, our local institutions. So now you're seeing divestment happen um, around fossil fuel divestment. That's been a huge thing happening. Why can't we do the same for the military? And so that's been happening in some of the universities. We're beginning to see students push for divestment from military and military contractor um, kind of uh, investments. So um, that's another way to approach it as well. Um, also, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, how, how we do the divestment. It's very important to be very uh, analytical about how you're going to do the investment. Just declaring a, a divestment and then just doing it without thinking about the repercussions. And I want to talk about some of the big ones. Like we have uh, this private prison corporation, which is now called Core Civic. It is a huge, uh, I think it's multinational now, but it's a giant corporation, private corporation that makes money off of imprisoning both people who are going through the uh, federal uh, prison system, but also people who are being detained by ICE. And those contracts are paid by our tax dollars, and that money goes to the to the shareholders of the course civic so well let's let's get companies the idea is let's get companies to divest from core civic well that's not going to work because core civic doesn't really care it's massive it has um has huge power and it's also not something that's publicly known there's no public pressure about it so we've been talking a lot about american friend with american friends service committee in san francisco because they are working on studying great ways of how to divest uh, they're a great resource they've been studying this movement across the country and across the world of making divestment and, and um, sanctions and boycotts illegal um, they're studying those efforts and then trying to figure out how to turn that to our advantage so one of the things that uh, they advise is that when you're going in and you're doing a divestment strategy whether it's against uh, a company or a or a state, you really want to look at what's going to make the most expressive story. What's going to make sense to the people that you're trying to reach out to? So Core Civic, we, can't, we will have very little effect if I tried to do a divestment program against Core Civic, this private prison company. However, there are a lot of service providers that Core Civic contracts with to provide resources to the prisons. One of them is food, Sodexo. Well, Sodexo not only provides prisons, it provides schools. So now what we can do is we can go into the school systems. We had success in this in, in New Jersey. You go into school systems and say you should not be using Sodexo as your food provider because they support private prisons. And it, 
and you can talk about the food and all that other stuff about the, the food industry and however you want to phrase it. Again, you're looking at who your, um, your public is, the messaging that you want to do. So we were successful at getting Sodexo to start uh, declining to support Core Civic. So that's a win-win. So it starts putting pressure on Core Civic. So you start looking for the service providers. Um, so you mentioned SodaStream. So SodaStream actually had, I think it was Scarlett Johansson, yes. who was her spokesperson. And so SodaStream didn't really care uh, about, well, they did care about their image, but they, the, the divestment and the boycott wasn't working. So what happened was uh, Scarlett Johansson is also spokesperson for an, Thank you. Oxfam International. So now the pressure was put on Oxfam International. She has to make a decision. as an, And she did. And she made the decision to stay with SodaStream, I think. Right. But what that meant is she lost the contract with Oxfam. So, right? So that is kind of, that's the, the way you can work the divestment strategy. You're thinking about what your target is. You're thinking about the public. What stories really resonate with the, with the public? And then how you look at the giant system and where you put your pressure. CoreCivic doesn't give a shit. But the companies that service CoreCivic care because they service many other local businesses. So it's just one strategy that we've been talking about. So I thought that was pretty, um, pretty impressive. Um, for the divestment, I do want to say, you know, being a war tax resistor has consequences. Um, and that's part of what you accept. The great thing about, and I shouldn't say this online, I guess, but um, I, <laughs> well, IRS right now is struggling with funding. So, well, those of us who were resistors in the past got a lot more uh, attention from IRS. I actually haven't got that much attention in the, in the last five years that I've been doing this. Um, that may change, but I just want to say, because it is illegal, you will get these letters when you do your war tax resistance. You will get letters saying you owe this money. The penalties and the fees start racking up. Um, and there are ways of dealing with that as well. Um, it is, it's an illegal action, and it's something that I do willingly every day because I cannot stand the misery I see when I'm in some of my, my neighborhoods in San Diego and I go by these private detention systems. I go by these private prisons. When we were at School of America's Watch and we were standing out Eloy Detention Center. Eloy Detention Center is like a massive mini city in the middle of the desert. It's completely cut off from the rest of the world. And there are like, what, 2,000 human beings stuffed in there and daily tortured, if not physically, mentally. And I cannot accept that anymore. So... Thank you, thank you, Anne. So for the last 30 weeks, there's been a group of people standing in front of the Hall of Justice in downtown Los Angeles, yes, that's what it's called, to call upon our district attorney to prosecute those police involved in killing more than 400 people in the last five years under our district attorney, Jackie Lacey. Uh, and asking our district attorney to do her job and to prosecute. Um, not one has been prosecuted. And the families are coming together, black, brown, white. Uh, I think uh, there was a Russian family there one time. There were families from all over coming together to say the police have got to stop killing us, basically. And there's been um, no one more involved in this than Dr. Molina Abdullah. And I've been a part of some of those demonstrations and, um, and feel very humble that she has uh, come to join us tonight and tell us what's going on here and how does all this relate, uh, relate to divestment. Um, again, I'm especially honored that you're here tonight. Thank you. It's just for recording, right? Okay. 
So thank you, Kathy. Um, so I'm very thankful to be here. I'm thankful to be here with people who are w willing to put something on the line for a freedom struggle, right? Because it's important sometimes we say we believe in things and then we're not will willing to give up anything in order to get what we say we want, right? We have to remember that if we're struggling for freedom, there's a system that doesn't want us to have it and there are consequences for our struggle, right? And so um, I think that we have to be willing um, to pay those consequences, right? Um, if we have to, right? If we have to. Um, so when Kathy asked me to come, one of the things she asked me to speak about, I'm one of the original members of Black Lives Matter. For people who don't know, Black Lives Matter was formed right here in Los Angeles in July of 2013. And um, when we formed, we um, many of us had been involved in struggles against police brutality and the killings of our people at the hands of the police for years before this, right? But um, what Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi kind of conceptualized is a lot of us were in the streets doing what we call uh, intuitive organizing, right? Shutting shit down, basically, right? Um, they were having conversations about how this can't be another couple of days or a couple of weeks or even years of shutting shit down. It has to be a shift in the way in which we live our lives, that we have to um, engage in what we call building a movement, not a moment, right? And so um, that's what we've been doing. Many of us have been doing. That's what I've been doing for the last almost five years. Um, and about two years ago now, um, part of it was really being thoughtful and deliberate in saying, what is it that we believe in? And so um, right away, as Black Lives Matter was formed, and about 30 of us um, uh, were in that initial circle that formed Black Lives Matter, including about 15 of my students from Cal State LA's Pan-African Studies Department. Now, I think two of my students are here today. They weren't in that group, but just to let y'all know, right, rate the students, say hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're here for um, extra credit, though. <laughs> right? <laughs> but I think they're glad to be here, too, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but I mean, they made the choice. The class that they're in is called Race, Activism, and Emotions. There's a lot of other classes that fill the same GE requirement, right? So they could have taken something else. This class requires them to do activist work, right? And so um, that's a deliberate choice. They could have chosen to do something else to, you know, read more articles or talk more amongst um, their uh, student peers. And so um, that's a choice that they made. So that's admirable. Um, so the initial group was about 30 of us. And we were fairly conscious in saying, we understand there's going to be a shift in our lives. And we were also, most of us had a pretty clear understanding of what previous incarnations of black radical movements looked like and we wanted to um, learn lessons from them the good and the bad right and so as we moved forward we were very clear within the first couple of months in defining ourselves as a womanist black nationalist organization with a queer and trans lens and why that was important is because most of us in that circle were women a lot of us were mothers and single mothers at that and we didn't want to have to split ourselves and, you know, kind of hide our children from the movement. So that's why we have some members here. Asia's here. She's in Black Lives Matter. It's one of the reasons why you can attest there are always kids everywhere at Black Lives Matter stuff. Am I lying? <laughs> There's always kids because, you know, they want to be, you know, I can't leave my kids at home. Well, they're at home right now, so not all, I can't always leave my kids at home, right? Um, and we were thinking about like the stories of people like Joanne Robinson, who when she um, heard about Rosa Parks um, imprisonment um, and launched the Montgomery bus boycott, right? That she was in the grocery store shopping for her family. And the story is that she tells told is that she went home, she continued to shop, 
went home, fixed dinner, put her kids, you know, fed her kids, put them in bed, and then went back to her job as a university professor, called in some of her other women friends and students, and then stayed up all night making signs, mimeographing them, and posting them up at the bus stops, right? We don't want to build a movement like that where you still have to by yourself take care of your children and you still have to then kind of do the activist work separately. So we were deliberate in the kind of movement that we were attempting to build. It took a couple more years for us to figure out, well, what does that mean in terms of our vision? And I want to be clear also that we've since transitioned from a national network to a global network, and that's me meant a transitioning um, from, of our um, kind of framework from a womanist black nationalist um, organization with a queer and trans lens to a womanist pan-Africanist organization with a queer and trans lens, recognizing that black people wherever we are in the world are all connected, right? Um, and so our freedoms are tied together. Um, and that went into the building of a policy platform. And some of you are familiar with the Movement for Black Lives policy platform, and that's what I was asked to speak about. So I'll quickly kind of go over one of the planks on the platform, which is the Invest Divest um, plank. And the Invest Divest plank is really rooted in this idea that we are not fighting police brutality police violence, police abuse, and the killings of our people at the hands of the police by saying that policing needs to be reformed. That's some bullshit, right? Policing cannot be reformed. Policing in this country was built um, with a target on black people's back. It comes out of slave catching. How are you going to reform a, vest, uh, a vestige of slavery, right, of chattel slavery, right? You cannot reform that. And so we are abolitionists. We believe that we should completely abolish policing. We believe that you can um, have a holistic view of what public safety is and recognize that building safe communities means investing in public education, quality public education, investing in mental health resources, investing in after school programs and arts programs, livable wage jobs, investing in permanent housing, um, not spending in Los Angeles, we spend 53% of our general fund budget on police. We can make different choices. And so we have to divest from the things that are really attacks on our community. And I didn't plan to talk about this tonight, but um, I spent the day earlier with the family of Kenneth Ross. Um, Kenneth Ross was a brother who was killed on April 11th, um, just walking through a Gardena park. He did nothing, absolutely nothing but possibly didn't respond well to police be commands because he was bipolar schizophrenic, right? Police have no business dealing with Kenneth, right? The day before Kenneth was murdered, they murdered Grishario Mack inside of Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Mall. They didn't even bother to evacuate the damn mall, right? They murdered him in front of children, in front of parents, in front of workers, that never would have happened at the Grove. It never would have happened at the Beverly Center. It happened because that's the Black Maw, right? And it happened because Grishario was Black and poor, right? And so we need to think about if Grishario is in a mall or Kenneth is in a park, how dangerous it is for us to have police roaming the streets with guns who see us still with targets on our backs, right? There shouldn't be a mother mourning the loss of her 25-year-old son, right, who leaves a four-year-old son himself, right, who he was raising, right, and there's all these attacks on black men, right, not raising their children, which is a lie. Every study will tell you that black men are the most involved male parents that there are, right? They do more with their children than fathers of any other race, right? But there's this narrative, right, about absentee black Fathers, in both of these murders, Kenneth and Grishario were very, very active parents with their children. So their murders, we've, um, as Black Lives Matter, White People for Black Lives, um, Matthew, Matt's here from White People for Black Lives, um, we've launched uh, more than a hashtag LA. 
um, which is really kind of to lift up the narrative of who our folks are. They're not criminals. They're not just people to be seen as disposable. These are fathers. These are mothers. These are sisters, brothers, daughters, sons. These are valuable members of our community. And whether they supposedly committed a crime or not, their lives are not disposable. Right. And so we're doing that work. And part of that work is saying that we have to invest the dollars in the things that actually make our community safe and divest from policing, divest from jails. One of the things that's moving now is um, and I have some petitions here. Um, we Black Lives Matter does not do electoral politics, has not. And, or legislative politics. And that has been how we've gotten down for the last four and a half years, with a few exceptions, right? We haven't um, co-sponsored the first two bills that we've ever co-sponsored in our history. Um, one is a police transparency bill, and one is a use of force bill, Stefan's Law for Stefan Clark in Sacramento. So we're pushing those legislatively, and then locally, um, we're opposing the building of a $3.5 billion new jail in Los Angeles County. What else could we do with $3.5 billion, right? And so what we're doing is opposing that and also saying that the sheriff, um, which is one of the deadliest, so the LAPD is the deadliest um, law enforcement unit in the country. They kill more people than any other law enforcement unit in the country. And right behind them, and sometimes they surpass them, but not in recent years, not under Charlie Beck's watch, right? Um, but right behind them is the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, right? So we successfully, one of our co-founders, Patrice Colors, was at the forefront of pushing for a civilian oversight commission for the sheriff. She got that. We won that, right? Yeah. So that... Um, commission has been in place for a couple of years, and there's a, actually a couple of really, really good people on it. Um, Rabbi Heather Miller is phenomenal. Priscilla Ocean is really strong. We have a couple of other folks who really kind of see our perspective, but the commission has absolutely no power. So sometimes you have good commissions, those good commissions have no power. And then you have rubber stamp commissions like the Los Angeles Police Commission. They has hella power, but they're a rubber stamp organization for the police. So the other piece of legislative work that we're doing is we are running a ballot initiative that is about invest, divest. We want that three and a half billion dollars to go to mental health resources, to go to dr drug rehabilitation services, to go to those kinds of things that make communities safe, and we don't want it to go to the building of a new jail. We also want the Civilian Oversight Commission to have subpoena power so that the sh sheriffs have to be accountable to a body. And so I'm gonna pass these. I hope that's okay, Kathy. I didn't ask you before. If you're willing, um, to sign this, and it says on here about, um, about being a paid petition gatherer. Some of them are paid petition gatherers. I am not, right? Um, but this is something that we believe in deeply as Black Lives Matter. It's one of the things that we're pushing, and we were able to raise some money to get some of our folks, a lot of our skid row activists, a lot of our student activists paid for when they do circulate these petitions, but I'm not one of those paid petition gatherers. This is for people who are Los Angeles County voters. You must, not city. So Inglewood folks, for sure, right? So Los Angeles County registered voters. If you are not a registered voter, then please don't sign. If you are a registered voter in LA County, we would love to have you sign. We know that usually initiatives are pushed by big money and we don't have big money. Um, so we have voice, right? We have lots of us. That's what counters big money. I think we have about, Matt, do you know we have about uh, almost 50 something more days, right? Yeah, yeah. This goes on the, on a, the November, this is for the November ballot. So that's why. Is it? It's local. Okay. Right. 
Yeah, it's just one petition that's going around. There's just a couple of copies, so you don't have to wait on. Yeah. Okay. You're gonna see a lot of people pass it. Okay. Okay. So I'm stopping there. Are we? Yeah, yeah. I'm stopping there. I'm stopping there. If that's okay. Um, and I just want to lift up um, the work. Um, so we always say when people ask, what do we need as Black Lives Matter? We always say your voice, your body, and your resources, right? And it's important that as Black Lives Matter, we built ourselves as a Black-led, ally-supported organization. I can tell everybody in this room is not Black, right? That <laughs> I'm smart like that, right? <laughs> um, you do not have to be Black to support Black Lives Matter. And I want to um, uplift Kathy's work who um, struggled with us. And we have several folks in the room who struggled with us for the last several years. Um, but especially in the last couple of years, um, we were really, thank you, Kathy, for being so involved in the struggle for justice for um, Keisha Michael and Mark Quentin Sandlin, who were killed. They were a couple who were sleeping in their car in Inglewood um, and murdered by Inglewood police. Um, leaving seven children without their parents. Um, and because of our collective work, because of our collective work, um, we were able to get the five officers who murdered them fired from Inglewood Police Department. Um, and it was really that that prompted this 30 week of actions um, in front of um, DA Jackie Lacey's office because the twin sister of Keisha Michael was really adamant now that we got them fired, we also have to get them prosecuted because they, we don't know where they are. They could be on LAPD now, right? They could be on any other police force. And so um, it's important, even though we, and it took us a while to kind of get there. So we've only been here for the last um, seven months or so. We didn't used to say there's a chant that many organizers use in diet convicts and those killer cops to jail. And I always hated that chant because I'm like, how are you going to be prison abolitionists talking about indict convicts and somebody to jail? So our position, so I've been talking, I, a lot of our mentors are former members of the Black Panther Party. And there's this concept of um, survival pending revolution, right? As long as... <laughs> As long as there are prisons, we want the murderous ass police in them, right? We, now, we want an end to prisons, but in, until there's an end to prisons and police, police deserve to be in the prisons, right? So we're now there and we're allowing ourselves, we're, we're recognizing that those who are most affected by it need to be the leads and universally the families want these murderous police in prison. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and last uh, on our panel, we have uh, Paula Khan, um, who's been working with Code Pink. She's not speaking as a rep of Code Pink tonight, but is going to talk about anti-war organizing. And it's going to be. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Go ahead. Awesome. Oh, this is so exciting. Uh, awesome. So hi, everyone. I'm Paula Graciela Khan, and um, I formerly organized with Code Pink. I haven't since September. Um, and yeah, so I'm very blessed to be on this panel. I'm currently at an um, at a Zapatista house in Tijuana because I came to Tijuana to volunteer with the Central American uh, caravan of asylum seekers who have been um, who have been marching throughout Central Central America, starting from Honduras, and have been traveling. They started out as a uh, 600 folks, and um, they 200 of them have um, turned themselves in at the border. There's gonna there's been more people that have been integrated into the group of folks that are turning themselves into the border. And I just wanted to be really transparent about where I'm at right now because I felt very called as a uh, Guatemalan person to come and support my people since they are understaffed here um, and so today I'm going to talk about how I've been navigating um, white supremacy and toxic masculinity and how I've been 
um, leading. I'm, so, I'm sorry for the noise in the background. Um, folks are building community. Um, but yeah, how I've been navigating um, white supremacy and toxic masculinity since a young age um, and what my divestment work has looked like. And that's um, been popular education for the most part. Um, and I find myself improvising um, through it all the way. So um, my, my piece is going to be more of a personal testimony and the movement building work that I've been doing and uh, the intersectional movement building work that I've been doing. Um, so um, I'm a Guatemalan Jutina, <laughs> uh, Jewish Latina. So my mom is Guatemalan from Guatemala. And my father is Jewish German. His parents fled um, Germany during the Holocaust and went to Chile. And so I feel like that's, I've inherited, um, you know, double history of genocide from both lineages. And um, I found myself, you know, in the anti-war movement, um, you know, very intuitively, um, very intuitively. And I was very dismayed to find that I didn't feel like I had a voice in the anti-war movement because I feel like the anti-war movement um, has failed in certain ways that, um, and I feel like um, our movement lacks intersectionality. So I would really like to speak to this, um, starting from, you know, talking about how in the, in the, in the 50s and 60s, um, we saw we saw the civil rights movement. Um, we saw a lot of movements of accountability holding uh, the U.S. accountable for impeachment for access. Are you still there, Paula? Um, um, begin to build momentum and. Hello. Can folks keep... Yeah, you're you're cutting out a little bit. I don't know if you can, if there's any better service where you are, but keep, keep going. We'll let yeah. you know. Is this better? Yeah, so far. Hello? Yeah, yeah you're good okay. so far. I'm so awesome. I don't really where to start, but I'll start with, um, you know, I experienced sexual violence as a youth, um, starting in middle school. By the time I got to undergrad, I began to address uh, the pervasive sexual violence and toxic mass by um, consent training the student housing units in New Berkeley at the student cooperatives. And so I want to um, share the model of popular education with folks as a way to divest from white supremacy and toxic masculinity, because I really do, um, in order to make our movements more intersectional, in order to make them more accessible, in order to make our movements more stronger, in order for us to be able to support the most marginalized communities and being able to participate in war tax resistance, we really need to look inward and we really need to see how we're going up to create safety nets for the most marginalized and directly targeted communities. Um, so I'm just going to share a little bit about how I did that. Um, so noticing that sexual violence happening in the student housing unit that I lived in, I pulled together some resources and I began to send education training student housing unit. I began to do it at the, um, the doors to um, the parties we would have. And it's super DIY, aka do it yourself. So it's a model that's accessible to folks. And um, soon after I began, I noticed that in the um, student housing units, um, the man is dominated by white folk and by privileged folk. And so um, I ran for house president at the student housing co op that I lived in. And I began to implement anti oppression trainings at the student housing units, which which were met with, um, you know, a lot of controversy with folks that it was, it was not the most comfortable thing to 